you all for, for joining us this morning. We continue with this the morning session. Our next speaker is Professor Eduardo Teixeira. Um, Professor Eduardo Teixeira graduated from UT Austin in 2005, where he worked in the direction of Professor Luis Caffarelli, a Hill Assistant Professor at Rutgers University from 2005 to 2008. Eduardo became full professor of mathematics at the University of Federal de Sierra in 2010. A leading figure in the field of analysis and PDEs, Eduardo's interest sits at the intersection and very much explores the synergies of regular theory of free boundary problems. Eduardo's impact has been mutually acknowledged, a member of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences, and has also received the inaugural MCA Prize in 2013 and the Hamilton Prize in 2017. With several former students, Eduardo has taken part in various evaluation panels and editorial activities. It's with a great honor and a deep sense of privilege that I introduce this friend of the Brazilian mathematics, my friend, and our next speaker, Professor Eduardo Teixeira, who today is talking on the critical point regularity for quasi-linear problems. Okay. Uh, thank you, Edgar. It's beautiful words. Very, very... Uh, uh... Generous words, I appreciate that. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, it is a privilege for me to be delivering this talk from home. Uh, and, uh, and I hope every uh, this talk finds you guys well, wherever you are. Uh, okay, so, so this is, this is a talk uh, that has to do more or less what with Edgar just mentioned. So let me start by, by mentioning about the Piloplacian operator. I think everybody here in this talk should know it, but typically um, it's a classical problem in the calculus of variation when you minimize uh, the P directly integral. So it's the classical problem is with when P equals two, uh, but if you minimize uh, the Dirichlet integral with any p greater than two, the uh, the energy function associated to it it's still convex, but it's not uh, uniformly convex. Okay, so minimizers are weak solutions of the p Dirichlet integral. So it's it's a divergence form elliptic operator uh, of that form. Okay, so this is a typical problem in the calculus of variation that is tons of, of theory uh, pertaining to the uh, P Laplacian operator. I would like to point out that the key feature of this operator is that the coefficients called marks are uh, degenerate in the sense that they, this is a diffusion process, but the diffusion uh, degenerates at critical points. So when, when the gradient vanishes, the whole diffusion uh, process collapse, okay? And this is the key reason why this operator is more interesting than the, uh, the linear counterpart, okay? Uh, this is a very well uh, uh, known uh, theory, has maybe 50 or more, maybe 60 years of studies. And uh, there is what's called the soft analysis. The soft analysis, whatever, whatever you can prove using a uh, linear or nonlinear functional analysis, we call soft analysis. And it's pretty similar to, to the linear theory. Okay, I'm not saying that it's easy, but it's pretty similar. Whatever you prove for the Laplacian, you should expect the corresponding result for the P Laplacian. Uh, there is also a nonlinear potential theory, a very robust nonlinear potential theory that can be proven um, that parallel to, to the harmonic analysis uh, involved in the, Lapla in the Laplacian counterpart. Uh, and it's been known for quite some time that solutions are C1 alpha. And, and, and this is optimal in the sense that solutions may not be twice differentiable. Okay? And this is also known for maybe 50 years. Okay. So now uh, what I'd like to uh, point out is that there is a clear connection between diffusion defect, the, pro the fact that the Laplace, the P Laplacian loses its ellipticity uh, when, when the gradient vanishes with 
the uh, regularity theory involved with p harmonic functions. In other words, <clears throat> the way that I like to think is that the regularity theory for p harmonic functions is really a mathematical manifestation of diffusion defect. So let me try to explain this. Uh, so if you think about harmonic functions, it's clear, uh, it's very well known that harmonic functions are a uh, synfinity. As a matter of fact, they are uh, real analytic. Uh, whereas the P harmonic functions are just C1 alpha for some small alpha, which is even unknown. But if, you, if I just say this, I'm not telling you the whole story. Uh, a closer look reveals that, as a matter of fact, P harmonic functions are as smooth as harmonic functions away from the critical point. Okay, so, so if I just say that P harmonic functions are just C1 alpha, I'm not telling you the whole story. And that's what I'd like to understand is that something funny is going on precisely where the gradient vanishes. And if you want to understand critically this equation, you really need to understand geometrically the behavior of this function at a critical point, okay? Uh, so let me make a small detour, which is just an apparent detour because I will connect this thing. Uh, this is very similar to the theory of pre-boundary problems. So let me revise what it's an obstacle problem. So the obstacle problem and the typical obstacle problem is when you are minimizing let's say an energy, let's take the simplest one, the linear strictly convex uh, uh, Dirichlet integral. But the problem is that you impose u to be greater than or equal to a given function phi, okay? So this is the obstacle, it's a very well-known problem. It's, it's arguably one of the most beautiful and well-studied uh, pre-boundary problem. Okay, so <clears throat> this is, is very well uh, understood, this problem. We know that minimizers of this uh, optimization problem is harmonic in the set where u is, is greater than phi. And, but solutions are just C11, okay? But again, if I just tell you that solutions to the harmonic to the, the p the harmonic p obstacle problem is just c11 log i'm not telling you the whole story because they are as a matter of fact harmonic away from the obstacle uh, and they lose quote marks their uh, regularity precisely when they touch the obstacle and it uh, when it really uh uh connects with the obstacle in a C11 fashion, okay? So <clears throat> this, uh, if, I, if, I, if I try to make a parallel, a bridge or an analogy of analogy of these two problems, uh, that's where uh, the uh, so-called non-physical free boundaries uh, appear. It's this idea of uh, understanding problems that are not per se obstacle problems or, or free boundary problems, but with the lights at, as if they were a pre-boundary problem. And I hope these two examples that I brought uh, do uh, make a compelling argument that this might be an interesting strategy, okay? So uh, the heuristics of this principle, it's basically the following. Smoothening defect is given by, a, 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 in a given model indicates, indicates diffusion fading. So, so Whenever you see that, if it's a diffusion, of course, if you're studying uh, equations that you are not expecting a regularity, then it's okay. But whenever you, you, you are in a, in a dif dif diffusion model and there is a smoothening defect, this should be very much related to somehow the diffusion being seized, okay? So for a robust cold marks model, and I'll try to explain what I, I mean by robust, a diffusion seizing happens intelligently, okay? And this is all just a heuristic. I'm, this is, I'm just talking uh, nonsense here. It, there is no math connected to that. We, the whole job afterwards is to make these heuristic principles uh, into, it, is to transform those heuristic principles 
in theorems. But uh, robust models, diffusion season happens intelligent, in other words, in special regions of the model. So if you think about the obstacle problem, the, the, the main brain adjusts itself because it could touch the obstacle anywhere, but it adjusts itself as to minimize energy and to, to minimize tension. And because it does this in an intelligent way, in a, in a, in a, by means of an optimization problem, it will have some constraints of the geometry. And that's the key point that we are trying to make here. Okay, so, oh yeah, I, I forgot to say, in, 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 in P harmonic equations, that's precisely in uh, the points where the gradient vanishes. So somehow, if you're studying the pure P Laplacian equation, somehow all the nuances of the problem are uh, confined into the critical points. And so you, that's what you should try to understand. Okay. Uh, but I'm not claiming here that this is an easy problem. This is a well-known result that says that p-harmonic functions are C1 alpha for an alpha which is given by this uh, crazy looking uh, formula. Okay, uh, even worse than that, uh, the, these estimates are not even known to be universal. Okay, it's just the solutions are, are, are C1 alpha for that specific alpha, but you don't have any, any control of the C1 alpha norm of you with respect to uh, lower norms of, of you, let's say the L infinite norm of you. Um, <clears throat> and, and of course, this is a major open question, it's a very hard open question, is to find the maximal quote marks, uh, C1 alpha universal regularity for P harmonic functions. And again, uh, what I, my, my key point here is that if you want to do that, really you need to understand the, beha the geometric behavior of you or H at a critical point. So somehow the, the whole process adjusts a U in such a way that when the gradient vanishes, uh, it will uh, accommodate some particular geometry, okay? And that's what I'm gonna try to explain as, uh, the, the, as the, my, my, my talk continues. And uh, a conjecture is that as a matter of fact, this alpha is always greater than or equal to one third plus a, a, an error that goes to zero. And this makes connections to another major open problem, which is the C1 one third regularity for P for infinite harmonic functions. And I don't want to deviate too much, but uh, I mean, if you solve this, this conjecture, you would also be solving one of uh, another major problem in regularity theory which has to do with the C1 one third regularity for uh, absolute minimizing of the Lipschitz norm. Okay, here's another conjecture, uh, which is more, more educated in the sense that, okay, it's maybe as hard as the other conjectures, but at least here you can make some more educated guess. Uh, so instead of looking for P harmonic functions, if you look for functions whose P Laplacian is bounded, then you can make a more, uh, a guess. And the guess is that uh, solutions are C1 beta or for some beta, which may be less than, than alpha because you are broadening the family of functions that you're considering. Uh, and the conjecture is that uh, all functions who P Laplacian is bounded is CP prime is smooth. okay? And it's a very, very fancy conjecture, and we have some, some uh, uh, results. Uh, it fails, so, so this conjecture is not true if P is, is, is true. In other words, in the linear setting, this, the conjecture is not, true, true, is not true, but the reason why it's not true is because you would be trying to prove C11 estimates, okay? Um, but the reason why this uh, conjecture is so uh, hard is because if the conjecture is proven true, then uh, the absolute value of x to, sub, to the power p prime 
would be the worst, in other words, the, the least regular function whose Pilaplosian is bounded. And here I would like to point out that this function, uh, the Pilaplosian is constant. So if, if I prove the, con the, P the CP prime conjecture true, I would be saying that for problems with a, a P governed by the Pilaplosian, if you have a bounded and L infinite right hand side is equivalent to having an analytic right hand side. Okay, so this in, in initially should be counterintuitive. Okay, uh, the conjecture has been proven true, and this is something that I'm happy to to say that was proven by with two uh, dear friends, uh, Jose Miguel Urbano from Coimbra and uh, uh, Damião Araújo, professor at uh, Federal do de Paraíba. Uh, and uh, we proved that this conjecture is indeed true in two dimensions. Very good. Um, but here are some new results. Uh, the conjecture does have a very specific uh, geometry, and that's what I'd like to try to explore. So uh, the geometry of the conjecture goes like this. Um, if you take a point, if you have a function whose Pilaplosian is bounded, let's say, and you take a point, let's say a critical point, uh, then what, what I'm saying is that if you play, you can always place, let's say if x naught is zero, just to, to simplify, you can place this uh, cone-like shape uh, that, I mean, it, up to a constant, I can place two uh, compatible barriers touching this point. And the, the, the geometry of the conjecture is that any solution, any solution to the P harmonic to the Pilaplosian being bounded should be trapped by these two compatible uh, 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 curves. Okay, so that's that's how we we import free boundary technologies to study these uh, problems which are not free boundaries, but they should be understood as if they were uh, a free boundary problem. So the the the, the conject the geometry is like this, and uh, and here is something that we recently proved. Is that uh, so? If f is bounded in the sense that it's less than or the absolute value, let's take f positive is less than than c, then you have these um, this upper uh, estimate which says that solutions should be c one. CP prime. If F is bounded away from zero, okay, we can prove that solutions cannot be better than CP prime. Okay, so so indeed the geometry of the conjecture is uh, precisely that. So uh, the second part, the the negative answer, is a new result that we have recently proven that basically says that. Uh, as long as f is away from zero, solutions really cannot be better than, than CP prime, okay? And uh, the conjecture, the, the, the second part of the conjecture is precisely if f is bounded, then solutions are precisely CP prime in the sense that it's trapped between these two compatible curves. Okay, now, if you understand that correctly, uh, the next big question should be, assuming the CP prime regularity conjecture true, okay, so it's a, a conditional result, uh, is there any regularity left, okay? So from the geometry that I just uh, showed you, uh, if F is away from zero, then there is no regularity left. There is nothing you can improve uh, because of this, which is by now, by to, as, as of today, is a theorem. Uh, but I'm not telling you the whole story because maybe if uh, the source ter term happens to vanish uh, at a critical point, then maybe somehow there is some regularity left, okay? Because somehow I would be imposing the diffusion to improve a little bit, 
of course, I cannot go beyond the CP CP prime regularity conjecture, but maybe maybe there is something beyond. I mean, there is I I, I cannot surpass the optimal regularity for p harmonic functions, but maybe I can put something in between. And of course, you can generalize this, this question for uh, diffusion models in non-homogeneous medium. Uh, basically, you can think of uh, more general operators of the form A of X, uh, D of U, where A depends on X uh, and depends on, on, on the gradient of U as if it were, if, if it were a P uh, degenerate operator. Okay. Uh, and this part here uh, is, is the, the regularity of the coefficients, right? So if you look at those pictures that I brought here, uh, they, they sort of uh, embrace the heterogeneity of the medium. So the way that the medium adjusts itself, and it's very well known that this has a major impact uh, on the regularity of solutions. Okay, this goes back to Schaumann. Okay. Uh, so as a matter of fact, there are two types of regularity results that one can prove is that if I don't assume any condition, any continuity assumption on the coefficients, then solutions are C, are held or continuous. This is a very mm -hmm. important result, which gives you compactness, but it's a very far from, from the regularity that you'd like to have, okay? Uh, the perturbation theory, which is the Schauder theory, says that if uh, F is uh, continuous, if, if the, the dependence on X of the coefficients is continuous, then solutions are, are C1 alpha for every alpha. And the Schauder theory says that if, uh, if it depends as, as a Hilder continuous function, then solutions are differentiable. Um, so the borderline and much more difficult case is when uh, this dependence is, is in is Dini, and uh, one can prove that in this case, solutions are still differentiable, but they may fail to be uh, C1 alpha for, for C1 epsilon for any epsilon. Okay, good. Now let me present to you the main new result uh, that has been recently proven which connects this geometry that I explained with uh, the uh, regularity for P degenerate operators. So the theorem goes like this, uh, take a weak solution of this general operator uh, minus divergence of A of X du equals F of X du. So recall, if F, the source term is away from zero, then you should not expect solutions to be better than CP prime. That's what I, we proved. So what I'm gonna do is that I, I'm gonna assume that, okay, A uh, depends in a Dini continuous fashion with respect to X. So you just have C1 everywhere. But here's the main thing. I'm gonna say that F uh, decreases uh, as a power of the gradient of U itself. In other words, when the gradient vanishes, in other words, when the left-hand side of the equation uh, loses its ellipticity, the right-hand side also uh, uh, vanishes. So that's where you should expect to have some, if any, some regularity left, okay? So the main theorem says that then at an interior critical point, solutions are really better than CP prime, okay? And that's a, a, that's a major improvement because as I said, if F is away from zero, uh, solutions cannot be better than CP prime. Uh, solutions cannot be better than the optimal regularity for P harmonic functions, but there is a room, there is some room that you can improve. And this improvement is a consequence of the rate in which the source term uh, decreases along with the gradient. Okay, very good. So that's the theorem that I'd like to present to you. Uh, 
and I will just give you some ideas of the proof, which is a very intricate proof. Uh, for my, my surprise, it was a, a, a proof that in principle I thought would be much uh, easier to be carried out, but it turned out to be much more uh, intricate than I would have expected. Uh, so the first step is that, remember that, one second. Uh, remember that solutions to uh, the uh, solutions are C1, only C1. And you should not expect more than that because, uh, because, uh, uh, because of the coefficients. The coefficients do not allow the solutions to be more than C1 everywhere. But you should expect to have a better regularity when the gradient vanishes. And uh, this, is, this is the case. One can prove that at a critical point, solutions are C1 epsilon for a very small epsilon, okay? And this is basically an observation that we made a few years ago where we proved improved estimates for the Schelder theory. And these results are uh, were new even in the linear setting. And the key improvement is that how can you interact the process as to go from C1 epsilon naught to C1 epsilon naught plus a little bit, okay? And this little bit has to do with many things. So it's a very intricate uh, uh, recursive process. And then what you try to do is to interact the whole process that you go from C0 epsilon to C0 epsilon C01, and then from C01 to C0 epsilon one to C0 epsilon two and so on and so forth. Every time you increase a little bit, but then you lose the amount that you can increase. So it boils down to a very complicated uh, 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 convergence series that you have to study. And basically what we can prove is that these increments that you go at every, at, at every step does converge to these uh, magic number one over P minus M plus one. And here you see uh, the, the, the rate in which the source term decreases uh, influences the amount of regularity that you can, uh, the, that you can obtain. So just, just, just as, as a joke, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, uh, the one red paperclip project. Once I finished, that, that was a proof that I had in my mind for quite some time, but it took me like two months to be able to put it together. When I finished, I had the feeling uh, of this guy, uh, the one red paper clip project. I don't know if you guys know this. Uh, this is a very well-known uh, internet uh, thing that happened quite a few years ago that the guy decided to, to exchange a red paper clip, a worthless a uh, red paper clip by a house. Uh, so there is, if you Google it, you're gonna find this project. It was a very interesting project. Um, and uh, so that's what he did. And, and I felt that because I start with C1, which is basically nothing. So I just have one uh, red paper clip and I keep building up, building up, building up, up all the way up to the sharp uh, estimate. Uh, final remarks. Uh, the first remark that I'd like to point, of course, I don't want to uh, bother you guys with the details that, of the proof. As I said, it is an intricate proof. It's a very complicated proof. Uh, but uh, I would like to point out that it's alluding to realize that the new estimate is a sort of improved CP prime. So somehow uh, this uh, estimate that I, I obtain is uh, so this is just arithmetic, is really a P minus M prime, okay? So somehow the rate in which the source term uh, degenerates along with the diffusion uh, reset the diffusion uh, seasoning of, of the model. Another thing that it's important to obtain to, to, to comment is that the theory is naturally limited by the maximum regularity constant for the constant coefficients. So we shouldn't expect to, that solutions to that model to be more regular than p-harmonic functions, right? 
So this is another road. You shouldn't expect to prove anything beyond that. Uh, typically, if you think of uh, the constant coefficient equation, solutions are just C1 alpha max for some special uh, alpha max, which are typically unknown. But that's uh, this is where the theory becomes more theoretic. We know that uh, theoretical because we know the existence of such a number, but we cannot we cannot know for sure. Uh, any estimate on this number. Uh, but maybe, uh, is it possible? Maybe you should ask yourself, okay, I, I get this. There is no way to improve that. But the question that I place here is, is it possible to break free from such a theoretical barrier? Of course, with a penalty, you shouldn't expect this to be able to break uh, free from such a theoretical barrier everywhere. But surprisingly enough, you can prove that this happens in local extrema, which are critical points, right? So we know from calculus three, critical points are either local max, local mean, or subtle points. So if you are in a local max or a local mean, you really can uh, break free from this and you can prove a much stronger regularity result. So this is the last theorem that I'd like to present to you, and then I'm done. Uh, if you have a weak solution of this equation, uh, and if you assume that you have uh, just uh, continuous coefficients, or maybe even less than that, uh, and you assume that Vf decreases as a power of V, then at any interior critical point, solutions are precisely that smooth, okay? So, and here you notice that solutions can be even C2, C3, C4, uh, because those numbers as P, uh, as M plus one approaches P, this blows up. So uh, it's a much stronger uh, regularity result, which can be proven only at local extremum, okay? And, um, so basically, if, I, if I'm looking at a function whose P Laplacian happens to be a, a function that depends only on, on X and, and the gradient of U, so for all those points, uh, local max or local mean, I have that much sharper, a much better regularity estimates. In all of the other points, maybe solutions are just C, are just Hilder continuous, I don't know. But at a critical point, a critical local max, I have a much stronger regularity result, okay? Uh, so I think this is more or less everything that I had presented. And with that, I, I thank, uh, again, the organizers for putting together this beautiful uh, uh, conference. And I'm delighted to, to take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Eduardo. It's a very nice talk. Uh, are there questions or comments in the audience? You can either ask Eduardo directly or can write in the group chat. I mean, if I may, I have I have one question, and of course, of course, I'm very very happy seeing you talking about this about these topics. And I mean, it's, for me, it's a it's a, it's always a joy. So let me let me ask you this: Is there any is there any any interest? in examining this kind of problems in the presence of discontinuous operators. I mean, in the sense that the coefficients change discontinuously somehow depending on the, on the solutions. Uh, yes. Uh, so if, if the coefficients, so it will be very interesting to, to, to try to develop a theory where uh, the operator itself uh, is sensible to discontinuities on, on the gradient of the solution, right? So, so maybe, 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 maybe instead of working with the P, P Laplacian to work of on a P of the grade. So P of the gradient of U. And, and that might, might be an interesting uh, thing to look at because things is still, of course, of course, if you, if you are in a regime that you can prove C1 alpha, then the gradient of U is gonna be Hilder continuous. So you could pretend that you are in a, in a P of X Laplacian and then you would have C1 alpha estimates, right? 
Uh, but when the gradient vanishes, then maybe uh, there is some hidden uh, regularity. And, and so, so the question would be, would, would, would solutions to that equation be uh, in a Helder continuous regime or they would be smooth enough to place you in a C1 alpha regime? Uh, of course, this is gonna depend on, on how P as a function depends on, on the gradient of U, but that might be a very interesting uh, uh, new line of investigation. And of course, there are those, all those problems that I mentioned. Of course, I just look at the theoretical aspect of the problem, but they are really related to, to physical phenomena that we can uh, somehow model based on these, uh, on these, these equations. But that, that could be a very interesting question, uh, Edgar, to, to look at, uh, let's say, a, a sort of P uh, of the gradient of U Laplacian. I don't know. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't bet anything okay. here. Whether you would be in a in a Hilder continuous regime or in a C one alpha regime, but certainly the the techniques used uh, to prove the theorem that I proved prove today would probably lead to some result because it would be again an inter interactive process as you improve a little bit, a little a little bit, but in this case you would have a a, a borderline. Because if you start less than C, uh, less than Lipschitz, maybe you're not going to be able to reach Lipschitz. And if you start you after reach, Lipschitz, you could improve a little bit. That would be very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your, for your words. Mm -hmm.